to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here today who will not taste death until they see the kingdom present with power. Mark chapter 9, verse number 1. We welcome you today to our study of the gospel of Mark. Today we're thinking about chapters 9 through 12, and we hope that you'll stay tuned as we're going to think about Jesus' powerful kingdom. We're going to think about the love that he has for lost people. We're going to consider some of the greatest questions and answers that have ever been asked, all while making practical application to our lives. And so be sure and join us today as we're going to study the majesty of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective Play Stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. Mark introduces us to the powerful kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to take your Bible and look at what Jesus says about that kingdom in Mark chapter 9, verse number 1. The Lord says these words, And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that there are some standing here today that will not, who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God, listen to this, present with power. Friend, there's a lot of things today that are said about Christ's kingdom that are just not true. There's the idea that Christ intended to set up his kingdom the Jews kind of thwarted that idea. God put it on hold and the kingdom's going to be set up and there's going to be a thousand year premillennial reign. Friend, if that's true, Jesus didn't tell the truth here. Here's what I mean by that. Jesus said, there's some of you standing here today. You will not die until you see the kingdom present as a present reality and until you see it present with power. Friend, Jesus clearly said that the kingdom was going to be set up during the lifetime of some of those people right there. Within that generation, those people who were living and breathing right then, before some of them passed away, 
They were going to see the kingdom as a present reality, and they were going to see its power. Well, when did that happen? D did Jesus' words come true? Friend, that's kind of an oxymoron in and of itself because Jesus' words always come true, right? God cannot lie. Hebrews 6, verse 18, Jesus is God, John 1, 1 through 4. Therefore, the logical conclusion is what Jesus said about the kingdom happened, and it did happen. You remember what Jesus said the kingdom was, right? Mark 16, verse 18 and 19. Jesus said to Peter, and I say that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And listen now. And Jesus said to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will already be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will already be loosed in, in heaven. I'm going, to, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. The church and the kingdom, that's God's reign. They're synonymous for the power and the reign of Almighty God. Okay, so that question answered, did some of those people right there in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, see the kingdom as a present reality with power? Well, absolutely. Acts chapter 2, we open up. There on the day of Pentecost, 50 days uh, prior to Jesus' resurrection, we, we hear about they're gathered in the upper room and the Spirit, Jesus promised, go in Jerusalem, you'll be endowed with power from on high. Luke chapter 24, verses 40 through 48. They're in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit comes upon them with power. Uh, they all begin to speak in unknown languages and the people are amazed with that power. And Peter brings his sermon that day to a climax. And he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God's made this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. And they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the clarion answer was, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And the Bible tells us, Those who gladly received his word were baptized. Acts 2, 42 and 43. And the Lord added to the church daily, those who are being saved, Acts 2, 47. Now remember, the kingdom and the church are synonymous. In Acts 2, verse 47, in that whole chapter, in that event in Acts chapter 2, they saw the power of God, and they saw the kingdom as a present reality. Friend, we're not waiting for a future kingdom. Colossians 1, 13, Paul said to Christians in the first century, you have been translated out of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. People in the first century were put in the kingdom. Paul preached the kingdom as a present reality. Acts 28, verse 28 through 30. Christians today, when you obey the gospel, you're added to God's kingdom. And so the power and the majesty of Jesus are on display as he is the head of that kingdom, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, we're citizens in that kingdom, Revelation 1, 5 and 6, Philippians 1, verse 20 through 23, and Christ rules and reigns in our hearts and lives today as we submit to him. Now, as you consider the rest of Mark chapter 9, we see the power of Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on that high mountain. He's there changed, transfigured before them. He begins to, to shine. His clothes are so clean, no launderer can make them that clean. And, and Peter, because he doesn't know what to say, he blurts out, Lord it's, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Hey, let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. The Bible says in one account, before he even finished getting that statement out of his mouth, a voice came down from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. God's confirmation of Jesus on that mountain is divine proof of the power and the majesty of Jesus Christ. Friend, as a result of that, the Christian wants to do everything he can to live in such a way that we don't misrep misrepresent that kingdom, we don't put a black eye out on that kingdom, we don't live in such a way that others are caused to stumble or fall from the grace of God. And we live that way because we know there are consequences to our actions. You see, we live in a world where people kind of feel like, there's, there's a mindset where people think, if you mess up and you do something, 
you really not maybe you don't have to suffer the consequences. Maybe you can get out of that. There's a sense of we're living above the law, kind of. Not with God. Look at the consequences of a life lived in sin. Mark chapter 9. I want you to see what the Bible says. Jesus will repeat this in Mark chapter 9, verse 44, verse 46, and in verse 48. Listen to Mark 9. Notice what the Bible says in verse 44. Where their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Friend, there's a place called hell. Yes, there's also a place called heaven. Heaven is a beautiful place of joy and bliss, and all who follow God and live faithful to His Word and do what Jesus says can go there. Friend, there are also consequences to not living like we ought to in the powerful kingdom of Jesus. If we live in a way that causes others to stumble, if we live in a way that aligns us with sin and the devil, there's a place called hell. It's a place where the maggot never dies and nobody ever reaches over and turns the air up. It just uh, turns the air down. It just, it's a horrible place. Worm does not die and the fire's not quenched. It's a place of eternal torment. Revelation 14, verse 11, Matthew 25, verse 46. It's a place where we are separated from God and good and loved ones who've been faithful. Luke 16, 19 through 31. And my friend, it's a place you absolutely don't want to go. That motivates and challenges us to ignore, to overcome temptation, and to continue to live like we ought to in the kingdom of Christ. But you know, in the kingdom of Christ, that, that powerful kingdom, as we mentioned, there are laws in that kingdom, and one of the laws in that kingdom is we're going to have to live true to God's teaching throughout the Scripture. And that teaching includes God's law on marriage. Look in your Bible in Mark chapter 10. The kingdom of Christ has certain laws. God has laws on marriage. And in Mark chapter 10, they come to Jesus testing him in verse number 3, and they've got a question. And he answered and said to them, they asked Jesus, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Testing him, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Heart, he wrote you this precept, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then there are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In the house, his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife, and marries another, commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And so God's basic teaching about marriage is one man, one woman for life. Now listen to that. Marriage is a man and a woman joining together for life. One man, one woman. Not, not, not two men and not two women. And that bond is for life. If you get set one day you wake up and say, I don't like my wife anymore. I don't like my husband. Hey, if you divorce her and you marry another, Jesus said, you're committing adultery. Now the only exception to that, Matthew 19 verse 9, whoever divorces his wife except for fornication and marries another commits adultery. The only scriptural reason for divorce is for fornication. And so friend, when we think about God's law on marriage, and then and only then does the innocent party have the right to remarry. But God's law is that men and women, when a man and woman come together, that's permanent. That ought to be for life. Don't, 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 don't treat marriage as something that is so fickle that you can just give it up and go marry somebody else. Inside that powerful kingdom of Christ, there are laws. God's laws on marriage apply to us, and we must live according to those laws every day. But friend, how do you... How do you live in such a way that the cares of the world, the temptations, the desire maybe for lust and new things, how do you live in such a way that all that stuff doesn't drag you down and become what you're focused on? Well, let me give you an example of a man. It's probably one of the saddest scenes in the Bible. I want to give you an example of a man who came to Jesus with the right heart, with the asking the right questions, but he just couldn't let stuff go. I want to show you that the stuff and the junk 
and the temptations of this life, they can get you off track real easy if you're not careful. Look in Mark chapter 10, and I want you to look beginning in verse 17. The Bible says, Now as Jesus was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. But listen to verse 22. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Boy, wouldn't you like to find a lot of people asking questions like this, kneel down, fall down before Jesus in submission. What do I need to do to go to heaven? Jesus said, keep the commandments. Do what the Bible says. Follow God. I've done all that. And Jesus said, mm, you remember that Ten Commandment? Thou shalt not covet. You've really not done that. One thing you still lack. I want you to sell what you have. I want you to show that you're willing to give. Sell what you have. Give to the poor. Come follow me. Take up the cross. The Bible says that man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That man let, let his stuff, the perishable things of this world, the things that, that tempted him, get in the way of him following Jesus. Friend, what about me and you? Wouldn't it be so sad to have all that stuff. To, you could have every passion. You could have every lust. And then you couldn't answer the question of Mark 8, 36 and 37 right. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, lose his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? That rich young ruler. Everything he had on the day of judgment, when he breathes his last and he stands before the Almighty after the last curtain falls. All that stuff he had, what good did it do him then? What about me and you? Sometimes if we're not careful, we can get focused on this life. We can get focused on the fun and the pleasure and the passions and, and uh, acquiring more and, and, and being looked, up high, looked at higher and pride and, and, and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. All that Satan will use to push you off focus. Learn from the rich young ruler that that's not the decision we need to make. And so instead of being like the rich, rich young ruler, who do we need to be like? Well, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus shows us. Mark 10 verse 45 reminds us we need to just be a servant. Listen to the example of Jesus. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The disciples are bickering in the context uh, they want to know who's going to be first in the kingdom. In fact, James and John and their mother, they, they, want, they want priority in the kingdom. Jesus talks to them, and the other disciples heard what they asked, and they began to murmur among themselves. And so Jesus sits them down and he says, Listen, guys, if you want to be, you want to be important, you want to be first, you want to be big in this kingdom, here's how it's different. You want to be first in the line, get to the back. First should be last, last should be first. You don't get out and self-promote you become a great servant. To be great in the kingdom of God, be a great servant. The servant is the one who's honored in God's kingdom. Why? Because that's who our Lord was. The Son of Man didn't come to be served. He had every right. He could have had everybody bring him a, everything he wanted on a gold or a silver platter. That's not the way it worked. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And Jesus says to us, Go and do likewise. And friend, that is illustrated. That, that idea is illustrated so beautifully in Mark chapter 11. Flip over to Mark chapter 11. And because of the miracles Jesus has been doing, because of the power, because of his feeding the people and the hungry and the sick and the poor, Jesus now comes into Jerusalem. And this is the triumphal entry. They're going to take Jesus. They're going to make him by force into a king. And so he comes in Jerusalem in this triumphal entry, which is prophesied in the prophets. But it's different, though. Jesus doesn't come in with the power of Solomon riding on a white stallion with power and pomp and pride. 
and comes in on the colt of a donkey, riding into town. They throw palm leaves out. Everybody's calling Hosanna in the highest, but it, it really didn't live up to their exp expectation because Jesus comes in a servant-like mentality. Imagine it this way. Presidential motorcade is coming into your town. What's that going to look like? Why well, you're going to have three or four big black dark tinted window SUVs riding in front of it. You're going to have a big presidential limo or Cadillac riding in the middle. Three or four presidential uh, service motor uh, vehicles behind that. Pomp and pride and prestige. You're going to let everybody in the news media know. Streets are probably going to be lined with that. What would it be like if the president came into town Riding in an old beat-up Volkswagen bug. Why, you'd think, eh, riding in the back of a Chevrolet truck. Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think as much about that. Kind of didn't live up to their expectation of what they thought the kingdom was going to be. But it shows the servant attitude and the servant mindset of Jesus our King. And then in Mark chapter 12, there are two great lessons that I want us to think about in this chapter. A lawyer comes to Jesus, and he's got a big question. It's a good question. Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? What's your take on it? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds, the first and greatest commandment. Mark 12, or about verses 24 following. First and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Mark 12, verse 30 and 31, and then Jesus gives them a second one. And to love your neighbor as yourself is like unto it. Well, what's, the, what's the essence of being a child of God like? Love God with everything you've got. Give him your life, give him your heart, give him your mind, give your whole being 100% to love God. And in the process, Love others. Love your neighbor as yourself. The two commandments are really three. Did you know that? Two greatest commandments are really three. Love God. The third, love your neighbor. The second, love yourself. Love God. Love yourself. Love your soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. That, that, that's the totality of what God wants us to do and how God wants us to live in this life. It's not about me and mine and everything I want. God comes first. I'm going to treat others like I want to be treated because I have enough value for myself that I'm going to value others highly because I have a soul made by God. I realize God also created them in His image. I'm no better than they are, and so I'm going to love God. I'm going to love others because I love myself and I want to go to heaven and I want to do what's right and please the Almighty. And friend, that's the, if, I, if you can get that right, all the rest is just going to kind of fall into place as we study God's Word and do His will. And so in Mark chapter 12, we're reminded of the power and the majesty of Jesus there as well. But as Jesus taught that, it's probably my favorite expression, my favorite statement in all the gospel accounts about Jesus as a teacher and as a preacher. Look what they said about Jesus in Mark chapter 12. Jesus talks about David and how David called him Lord and he, he teaches them that from the Old Testament scriptures. And at the end of Mark 12 verse 37, listen to this little parenthetical statement. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And notice these words. And the common people Heard him glad. What kind of preacher was Jesus? Did, did Jesus bring in the, the religious elite and the scholarly? And was, did he speak with big words in such a way that the, only the upper echelon, 5% five or, five or so, could? Uh, no. What kind, of, what kind of preacher was Jesus? Listen to that again. The common people heard him gladly. Why do you think it was the common people? who heard Jesus gladly? Well, I'll tell you why. Those were the people that Jesus was with day in and day out. He healed their sick. He cast demons out of them who were hurt by them. He fed them. 
they, he was with them day and out, day in and day out. They gave Jesus the opportunity to simply listen to what he had to say. They saw his love, they saw his compassion, and it's those people that Jesus related to. What a great compliment to the Lord. The common, the everyday person, they heard Jesus with joy and with gladness. Friend, what about me and you? As we think about Mark chapters 9 through 12, we've seen the power of Jesus' kingdom. We've seen the servant-like nature of who he was, even his entry into Jerusalem. We've seen how we ought to love God and give our heart to him. And we've seen that it's the common people that appealed that Jesus appealed to. Now, friend, what about you? What about me? Can, can I see the power of Christ enough to realize that I need him in my life? Can, can I realize that the riches of this life are really not going to take me to places that some think they're going to take me? They're not going to give me the lasting joy that I really need to have. Can I let go of that enough to really grab a hold of God's love and his kingdom? Friend, do you realize how much God loves you? God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16, do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Are you willing to turn from a life of sin in repentance and turn to God? Luke 13, verse 3, would you acknowledge with your mouth Jesus as the Savior? Matthew 10, 32 and 33, and have every sin washed away. Would you be buried with Christ in baptism into his death and rise out of that? to live faithful and walk in newness of life every day, Romans 6, 1 through 4. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to become one today, and may each of us love God and truly have a servant mindset. Join us next time as we conclude the Gospel of Mark. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, and downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the Gospel of Christ.